thanks for the invitation. The good news is that I'm not really on television anymore, so it's safe to switch on your sets again and uh, come out of the closet. Secondly, I was delighted to hear the introduction because apparently this is a panel full of, of, of prominent intellectuals and, and important thinkers, and I'm excited because I also always like to meet important intellectuals and prominent thinkers. I assume my role in this discussion is, as in all good entertainments, I'm the supporting act before you hear the prominent intellectuals and the thinkers. So I'll try and warm you up before the main acts come on. Um, I think listening very carefully to what to the two introductory remarks. Um, I think that there's a sort of underlying, I mean, the postmodernists call it a subtext, so I'm not going to use that word. Um, there's an underlying assumption, I think, a lot of the way we debate these, which, 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 which came, in, in, it came through in some of the things which were said a bit earlier. And, and the assumption is this. Um, that in 1994, after uh, an awful past, uh, we were given uh, this, this, this wonderful gift because this, uh, this great group of people uh, liberated us from our, our awful past. Uh, and what happened along the way somewhere in the last 20 years is that it all went horribly wrong and, and the great people who liberated us turned out not to be so great or, or, or fell under the spell of of evil fairies. Um, one very prominent academic colleague seems to think that this all happened when people fell under the spell of the evil fairy of Davos sometime in the 1990s. Other people seem to feel that it came uh, when the wicked witch in the pinstriped suit took over from the saint. And, and then, of course, the popular view at the moment is that you know it all happened when the, the sort of uh, barbarian in the, in, the, in the leopard skins took over from the pinstriped suit. Uh, I think, that, you know, that tends to be the way in which uh, many people see it. It tends to be the way in which much of our public debate sees it. It creates a, an interesting sort of unity among South Africans because people on the left and people on the right can also say the same things and feel warm and cuddly inside. Uh, what it doesn't do, I believe, is explain to us where we are and uh, where we would need to go. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, I don't believe that uh, we were given something miraculous in 1994, despite the fact that uh, I, I wrote a book which semi-satirically called it a miracle. Uh, I think that what happened in 1994 is all what always happens uh, when you have a transition uh, from uh, an oppressive regime to, to a formal democracy. And that is that certain opportunities are opened up. And I don't think that should ever be denigrated. I don't think that should ever be underestimated. I mean, anybody who wrings their hands and says that the vote means nothing uh, should try doing without it. Um, so these changes do matter. The rights which came with the vote matter. But on their own, they do not deal with the question that faces us this morning. They do not get to deal with the question of, of, of how does, uh, look, I, I don't like the title terribly much, but let's talk about ideas like an inclusive economy, a fair economy, an economy in which uh, everybody has a place. Uh, it doesn't do that automatically. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, advances, and they're always only advances. Uh, the, 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 uh, the introductory remarks talked about structural reform, and, and structural reform, I think, is a useful term because I think it describes what we're talking about. There used to be an idea years ago among people who believed in equality and social justice that, that, that one day the wicked old order would fall and the new dawn would come and we'd all live happily ever after in, 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 in equality and harmony. Uh, and it doesn't happen that way for a variety of reasons. What The, the way uh, change does happen, change which is sustainable, change which does make a difference to the lives of people, uh, is, is, is in a far more incremental way uh, in which power shifts happen within societies. And, and, and very often... Uh, this idea that the power shift is only a real power shift where some group of people take over government from another is misleading. And, and, and to give an example of what I'm trying, you know, so it's not just abstract and academic, to give an example of what I'm talking about, we, we observed, or some of us observed, or some of us noticed last month that it was the 40th anniversary of a rather important event in the history of this country, the 1973 Durban strikes. Uh, and if you look at the kind of events that occurred as a result of the Durban strikes, and you look back uh, at the 
uh, plight and the position of working people in Durban in 1973 who went on strike, and you compare their situation to that of working people now, or indeed working people 20 years after that, etc. Uh, I mean, besides the fact that we have these crises, uh, despite the fact that we have these crises in Marikana and these crises on the farms, which are real, I, I don't think anybody can seriously sustain the argument that there have not been substantial advances for working people. And that is what we mean by structural reform. And that structural reform happens in two ways. Uh, the first way, it is obvious, as any change in society always has to be, it is about power. It is about the way in which power is distributed in the society. It's, it's about who has power and who doesn't. Uh, and in a sense, what 1994 did uh, was mark a, a particular milestone, an important milestone, I've indicated that, but an important milestone in particular power shifts. Now, clearly, the power shifts which occurred in 1994 were either not sufficient uh, or either not of a type which made it possible uh, for us to have an inclusive economy. In other words, they were not of the type which led to the kind of structural reform which was necessary. It led to some, let's not forget that. I mean, once again, I mean, anybody who tells you, which you sometimes hear, uh, that the end of apartheid made no difference to people's lives has clearly been living in cotton wool for the last 25 years. Clearly, the end of apartheid made a significant difference to people's lives, but it didn't make enough of a difference to enough people's lives, and it didn't change the power relationships in the economy sufficiently uh, to make a substantial difference. So that's the one aspect of the problem we've been dealing with. And quite frankly, some of us made the point at the time, as horrific as Marikana was, uh, as difficult as the situation on the farms are, it's not simply a rhetorical phrase to, to make the point, these are not, you know, th th these, these are not examples of why did it all go horribly wrong. These are examples of problems which have been there, if you like, since 1652, uh, which took a particular form at that particular case. They are not an indication that something went horribly wrong in the sense that somebody fell under bad influences. They're an indication of problems and uh, uh, structural difficulties which were not dealt with and have not been dealt with. So in other words, it's simply a reminder, but a very important reminder of, 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 of us, of, of the nature uh, of, 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 of what we face, of the limitation of the change, of the fact that the change has not been substantial enough. So, so that is the first point. Power has to shift. Power shifts in all sorts of ways, and we can talk about that. Power shifts, once again, the 1973 Durban strikes are a very good example. Power shifts when people organize. Uh, power shifts when people begin building coalitions, power shifts when people uh, start reaching out to people in similar situations to their own. Um, so that is a very important part of the dynamic uh, which we need to look at. Incidentally, part of the, the importance of structural reform is, uh, I mean, to the extent that I have a, a contribution to make to this, I did study and was a participant in and wrote about the trade union movement which developed as a consequence of the Durban strikes. And, and, and one of the issues which, uh, I mean, to me, uh, the major issue, and it was very important in the context of anti-apartheid politics at the time to make this point, and there were all sorts of debates uh, uh, about this. Uh, the key uh, lesson we learned is that incremental, when people are powerless, incremental change is structural change. Incremental strategy, structural change, because it means that people who are not powerful begin to exercise power over aspects of their lives. So in other words, if you go back to the history of the labor movement uh, in, 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 in the modern era, uh, we often make the point that labor movement did not start uh, with a demand uh, for uh, a, a, an equal economy in which everybody had an equal share. The modern labor movement started with a demand for an eight-hour day. Um, and an eight-hour day at that stage was a major structural change because when the eight-hour day was won, it signaled that in, 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 in one small area, power had shifted, at least on that particular issue, because employers at the time did not want an eight-hour day. They wanted a 12-hour day or a 14-hour day. The effect of changing power in, in that way, it, it has uh, incremental effects because the evidence is very robust that when people... Uh, 
experience, when people who have experienced their lives as powerless begin to experience the exercise of power, then they start to say, but hang on, we can make a difference. We can change things. We can be more assertive. And then they start to want to make more demands and they want to change more. Uh, and that is a very uh, important part of, of, of the question we're confronting this morning because the question becomes, what needs to happen in the society? And to me, this is a far more question, important question uh, than, uh, than, than the issue of who runs the country, quite frankly. I mean, for what it's worth, I, I, I was in a debate with my <laughs> colleague, Hyde Maria, who wrote an interesting book a while ago. And I said the difference between Hyde and I was that he was disillusioned with the ANC and I'd never been illusioned with the ANC. Because to me, <laughs> and that's not a crack at the ANC. It's simply a point. The ANC is a is a nationalist movement with a lot of support among a lot of people which may be waning at the moment. It's an interesting political and sociological phenomenon. But the idea that uh, the future of South Africa depends on the ANC uh, is, is, is to me rather implausible and rather misleading. So instead of asking those sorts of questions about do we have the leadership we need, whatever that means, uh, we need to be asking these questions, what needs to happen and what ha is happening to make those power shifts a reality. Because, of course, the difficulty about those power shifts, uh, it is a lot easier. It was, wasn't easy at the time, don't get me wrong, but it's a lot easier uh, for working people in mass production workplaces to begin to exercise power than it is for dispersed people, people living in, 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 in uh, trading in the informal sector, people eking out a living. Uh, the obvious example, if the point needs to be made <coughs> to deal and maybe others will mention it, but to deal with a structural reality which is facing many people in the Western Cape clothing industry. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I probably got the timeline wrong or whatever, uh, many of the women of the Western Cape uh, used to go to work every day in mass production factories. Uh, they're now at home doing what is called cut, make and trim, in which they do piecework and sell their goods to the company. Now, the obvious point is that when they were going to the factories, it might not have been pleasant, but if they all stopped working, the employer has a problem. If they now all stop working, they have a problem. The employer can presumably source uh, the, the, the goods from elsewhere. Uh, and that is certainly a reality uh, which uh, those of us who are concerned about how we encourage uh, the organization uh, of people so that they can start uh, to push for these structural reforms and these structural changes uh, have, to, have to deal with. Uh, but to me, that is, that is the central issue. Now, the other part, and Fazila talked about this uh, to, to, to a certain extent, is that uh, this change cannot happen without negotiation. Now, at some stage in our history, some of us, you know, because we came from certain intellectual backgrounds where you weren't supposed to, you were supposed to be into the stuff I was talking about earlier in which change was supposed to be about, you know, one day we were going to run up the flag and then the world was going to change, etc. We had to be slightly embarrassed about this and say, no, well, look, you know, we understand that negotiation's a bit messy, etc. But we have certain realities here which are a bit uncomfortable and so change has to be negotiated here. Uh, I think we were wrong about that because the more I've read about it, the more I've thought about it, the more I've looked at comparative history, negotiation is the way in which change happens everywhere all the time. And we might as well start to get used to it. Uh, there aren't any cases in human history I'm aware of in which real change, change which has made a life difference to the lives of poor people and the lives of working people, has not been negotiated. Uh, and I think very often South Africans have a rather odd impression of what it means when one say, says this. South Africans across the spectrum, because either for some reason South Africans seem to be under the impression that negotiation is an event and incidentally, an event which always happens in places like these or places slightly up mark, more upmarket than these, uh, which is where they tend to happen, you know, where everybody gets together in a fancy hotel for three days and then passes resolutions. That's the one understanding of negotiation. And the other understanding of negotiation is that it's all about people being nice and cuddly to each other and friendly to each other. And therefore, people say, well, how can you negotiate with these horrible people who are exploiting the poor, etc.? Well, when I talk about negotiation, most people talk about negotiation 
negotiation. Uh, it doesn't happen in hotels. It happens everywhere all the time because it's a process rather than an event. And it's not actually about people loving each other. It's about people exercising power. But it's about people exercising a po power uh, in a context where you recognize uh, that you can't simply proclaim universal peace because there are, uh, there are important power interests in the society with which you have to negotiate, uh, with which you have to deal. And negotiate is a very broad term. In the labor context, obviously, at some point, it means that you literally do sit down a table and bargain and produce a piece of paper at the end which says what everybody's got to do. And that's very often the way in which negotiation turns out. But it's not the only way in which negotiation turns out. If we were to write, and we really ought to, if we were to write a history of our society over the last 20 years, you, you would see that a lot of things got negotiated in the society uh, by methods entirely other uh, human or academic. <laughs> Sorry? People minutes or academic minutes? People minutes, okay. So I've got 30 academic seconds, folks, five people minutes. Okay, so if we look back at the history of the society in the last 20, just simply since we became a democracy in 1994, you will see that all sorts of things have been negotiated. And how do you know that they've been negotiated? People have shifted positions. Certain realities are, are different now. The things that people are prepared to accept uh, are different. Uh, and that wasn't because somebody sat in a room one day uh, uh, making a, 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 a list of, of, of points which had been agreed. Now, what we are dealing with is a situation in which two, two problems still confront us, two major problems, two major realities, perhaps I can put it this way, about our post-1994 economy. And the first reality about our 1994 economy is, as I say, said, the power relationships have not shifted substantially enough. And the power relationships will only shift when we have a conversation uh, about what that would mean. Uh, my own contribution to the conversation is contained uh, in work I've done on my own and with colleagues over a few years on the Treatment Action Campaign. Uh, because what we wanted to do there was to understand how the treatment action campaigns work uh, informed our understanding uh, of, of, of how shifts of power could work. Uh, and just in a nutshell, uh, yes, it is about collective action. It is about building up people's willingness uh, and ability to act uh, collectively in pursuit of their interests, but it's also about other things. Uh, it's also about changing the nature of the debate. It's also about what we called in the Treatment Action Campaign study uh, the moral high ground, the way in which the Treatment Action Campaign in its particular context managed to use the moral high ground and managed to use moral coalitions uh, to, to change the way people thought about issues. Uh, and it also and always involves the building of coalitions, the building of coalitions in our context between working people and people outside work, but also coalitions between uh, uh, various groups across the society because the one thing which the Treatment Action Campaign does teach us is that very often if you're strategic about it, uh, there are alliances which are possible uh, across some quite unlikely barriers. Uh, and sometimes when one makes that argument, people wring their hands and they say, oh, well, you can do it on one or two issues, but you can't do it on the big picture issues. My point is that there aren't any big picture issues. <laughs> the, the immediate issues uh, of how you shift power in specific contexts are the big picture issues, and over time they build into big picture issues. And the other one is that you need to talk about negotiation. Uh, and there, uh, I think that one of the things people concerned about equity in the society and concerned about an in inclusive economy uh, need to devote considerable attention to, because there is quite obviously inherited power in the society. There are massive concentrations of power which have to be dealt with uh, and, and, and negotiated through if we're going to change the economy. Uh, but I find very little strategic discussion of these issues. Yes, we're all prepared to denounce that power, and that serves a certain purpose in the public debate, uh, or some people, such as the mainstream media, just ignore the power and pretend that it doesn't exist. Uh, what we really need in the society, I think, is a, is a great deal more discussion on how does one strategically engage with that power? Uh, how does one uh, initiate a, 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 a negotiation process with economic power holders in this country, which lead to the structural change? So to me, that is the, the agenda that we need to pursue. The one thing I will, however, 
qualify uh, this about, is to say that while I've tended to underestimate, because I think that's the appropriate way to handle it, I've tended, uh, and partly for effect, because I think that uh, one of the jobs of people like us, hopefully, when uh, debates are, we believe, missing the point, is to act as some sort of corrective and perhaps bring people back to what we think the more important issues are. I don't want to give the impression that government doesn't matter. Government does matter, and government matters in two ways. The first way in gov which government matters, and this is a South specifically South African point, is uh, anybody, and it's a very common feature, anybody in our economic debate at the moment who tells you that they have a recipe for full employment in the next 50 years is either deluding you or themselves or both. Okay? That is simply a structural reality. It's part of that history that I was talking about. We are not going to have most South Africans, we're not going to have the majority perhaps even of South Africans living in air, working in air-conditioned businesses uh, and workplaces over the next 50 years. And that is why government is important because that doesn't need to be uh, a, a problem. It doesn't need to be uh, a constraint to people because if you have uh, adequate uh, services in place, if you, have, if you have a look at something I'm very concerned about, if you are in a very small way, and that doesn't mean it's the solution to everything, if you have a look at the kind of concrete effects on people's lives which social grants are having on the ground in, in rural areas, that's a very good example of, of how a relatively modest program can actually enable people who are not in the formal economy to live decent, productive lives, which is a challenge, and you can't do that without government. Uh, and clearly, also, secondly, although I, I, I have suggested that and I have argued very strongly that, it's, we, that this is about stru structural shifts in the society rather than who's in government, uh, clearly the position governments take, so take on these issues can obstruct uh, or can assist this process. So I'm not for a moment suggesting, uh, as some of my colleagues do, let's just ignore government and hope it goes away. But I do think that we need a corrective in the debate which brings us back back to what to me are the two main challenges. How do we see poor people and excluded people and marginalized people in the society beginning to acquire the kind of collective power which working people acquired which will enable them to begin changing the reality which, uh, which, which they face? And secondly, what sort of negotiation strategies, what sort of coalitions, what sort of political strategies uh, would be required to support that process and to strengthen it? Thank you. Thank you.